Hi, this is Don Forsythe. Thank you as always for joining me. We are talking about teams. In my previous presentation, we discussed the nature of teams. We defined a team. We talked about various kinds of teams. And we also talked about the classic input process output model of teams, uh, the systems theory approach to understanding teams. In today's presentation, I just want to briefly touch on two key points, building the team and working in the teams. Uh, building the team defines who is part of the team. What are the personality characteristics of the individuals in the group? What are their skills and abilities? Uh, it's important to, to take into account the group composition when it comes to teams. Um, teams are, of course, wonderful in terms of maximizing people's performance, but there are limits to their effectiveness. If the individuals who are part of the team lack the requisite skills necessary for success, there's nothing the team can do to transform mediocrity into superior team performance. So what you put into the group as you compose the group will define in part what you get out of the team. Also, the way in which the group members work together collaboratively, the team processes, how they combine their inputs, will be important in determining their strengths and weaknesses and overall effectiveness. So let's review both of these topics uh, very briefly here today. In terms of building the team, we're going to talk about strong composition effects. Um, there needs to be a fit among the members in terms of their talent. Also, in some cases, individuals are more effective working in teams than others. I suppose the informal label for them would be team players, and some of us are team players, some of us are not. And it's important to include at least a few team players on your team. Also, it's important to take into account your level of skill of the members, uh, but probably the most important variable that we'll consider is the diversity of the group. In general, diverse teams are a benefit because each individual brings to the group unique strengths um, and minimizes overall group weaknesses. However, diversity uh, does tend to reduce the overall cohesiveness of the group, which is one of the benefits of working in teams, so we will deal with that. Of course, outstanding leadership is one way to solve the, the problem of increased um, divergence among group members, diversity among members, um, and cohesiveness. Team player researchers have looked to see what the relationship is between personality and capacity to contribute effectively to a, a team. If we conceptualize personality in terms of the five-factor model, uh, sometimes called the big five, we see that extroversion is somewhat related to teamwork uh, contribution, but agreeableness and conscientious are stronger predictives overall, particularly compared to emotional stability. Um, an openness falls in the middle range between emotional stability, extroversion, and agreeable and conscientiousness. Turning to knowledge, skills, and abilities, sometimes abbreviated as KSA, I mean, what, what does the, each member bring? How skilled are they? And there's really usually no surprise here when you discover that a team which is built which includes individuals who have a high level of knowledge, who are quite skilled, who have who have great abilities in, in the area required, those teams perform much better than teams in which the members are low in knowledge, skills, and abilities. So for most groups, most teams, we see that if their knowledge, skills, and abilities are low, their overall performance is weak. But as knowledge, skills, and abilities increase, you see an increase in performance. There are, of course, cases, uh, the rare groups, where there is no relationship between the knowledge, skills, and abilities of the individual members um, and the overall performance of the group, but usually the effect is an additive one. Synergy sometimes occurs where the knowledge, skills, and abilities of the individuals, that the group goes beyond those skills, but synergy effects are quite rare. Usually the effect is an additive one rather than a synergistic one. In some cases, the performance of the group uh, displays the weakest link effect, so that having one single weak member of the group is sufficient to undermine the group's overall performance. Groups that are working on conjunctive tasks, for example, 
ones which require each member to perform some aspect of the task before the group as a whole can succeed are more likely to display the weakest linked effect. And in some cases, there's the bad apple effect, where uh, one very uh, negative group member, either one who lacks knowledge, skills, and abilities, or has aversive personal qualities, can undermine the effectiveness of the group overall. But in general, the tendency is in most groups, as knowledge, skills, and abilities of the group members increase, so does the group's effectiveness. Diversity within teams is a pretty critical variable. Uh, as individual, as, as leaders, as organizations create their teams, they need to be mindful of, of and whenever possible to increase the diversity of those teams so that the teams will be creative, so that they'll draw on a variety of sources of information, uh, that they can be more adaptive and solve problems in the future. And the, however, uh, as researchers have looked at diversity, they distinguish between the various forms of diversity. So diversity can be in terms of demographic characteristics, such as race or ethnicity, differences in knowledge and skills. In general, it's, uh, diversity in knowledge and skills is not so great. Um, if that requires you include individuals who are less skilled or less able. But differences in values, differences in personality, differences in organizational status. So you have uh, a novice within the group working with somebody who's highly experienced and also differences in the social ties to the group and to the network. So as always, uh, diversity means a broader range of knowledge, skills, and abilities, and that's generally a good thing. There are advantages of these heterogeneous teams. Uh, but there's also heter advantages of homogeneous teams as well. Um, heterogeneous teams, less traditional solutions, more creativity, more capacity to overcome everyday sorts of problems, to be able to think outside the box. Homogeneous teams, they have a stronger social identity. You'll be less likely to have the group, the team, become schismatic and break up into smaller subgroups which are in conflict with one another. So the overall level of cohesiveness is higher. Usually there's reduced conflict and in general communication is a little bit smoother in homogeneous teams rather than heterogeneous teams. And if the group is working on a task which requires really good communication, effective communication where group members understand each other, which is particularly likely in uh, groups which are working online rather than offline, then homogeneous groups tend to be more effective than heterogeneous ones. There's often a distinction made between surface diversity and deep diversity. Surface diversity is generally easy to, to deal with. Uh, groups can overcome that easier. But whereas deep diversity, that means differences, say, in fundamental values uh, of group members within the group, uh, misunderstandings of what their, the group's ultimate goal is, uh, those can lead to problems in the long run within groups. Um, strong organizational support for diversity, however, is the best way to overcome um, the problems which are created by team diversity, uh, particularly uh, attempts to reduce the tendency for diverse teams to subgroup. There is quite a bit of work looking at men and women working collaboratively in teams. Uh, years ago it was suggested that uh, men were superior working in all male groups compared to women working in all women's groups that men by nature bonded more easily in their all-male groups. Uh, researchers have not been able to support that speculation um, that, and it does suggest that both men and women are equivalent in their capacity to work effectively in teams, suggesting that perhaps sexism and traditional, traditional views of sex differences are what created that uh, biased view of uh, male bonding. There is some research that, uh, in, that creating diversity, uh, including both men and women together in the same group, has its benefits. Sometimes, for example, an all-male group, when women begin joining such a group, it has what has been called a, quote, civilizing, unquote, effect on the all-male group. Although the women, as they initially join the group, experience tokenism, so they feel as though they're solos in the group and that their performance is usually rated more negatively than those by other groups. Uh, Hackman's work, for example, on uh, changing the composition of orchestral teams 
performing orchestras found that uh, women who initially joined the group um, had a very difficult time being accepted by the rest of the group when the group was mostly men. And that they oftentimes these groups went through a period of, uh, of conflict, basically, where their, their cohesiveness was reduced substantially as men and women mixed together in these groups. However, the good news is that as the numbers of men and women within these groups become equal, then conflict tends to even out and cohesiveness increases once again. Working in teams. I'll have to be brief here but and, and refer you to the text more in depth analysis of the factors that influence when people work in teams. But basically the questions are how well do members combine their knowledge, skills, and abilities through a coordinated series of actions? Uh, what cognitive psychological processes are, are required for effective, effective teamwork? And finally, the question of cohesion. Um, in general, we do expect our teams to be cohesive. And as a team loses its cohesiveness, it often loses its, its effectiveness as well. Uh, my analysis of team processes draws on Marx, Matthew, and Zaccaro's team process analysis, where they discuss these three collections of key variables uh, as groups move through their transition, and that involves prior to working on the task, identifying their overall mission, their specifying their goals, and identifying a plan, a strategy to reach their outcomes. Once they move through the transition process, they actually have to conduct the work. And as they do that, they need to monitor their progress within the work. Uh, they have to coordinate their efforts. There should be um, one member stepping in and assisting other members who are experiencing problems. And the third component is interpersonal processes, conflict management, motivation, affect, cohesion management, and social support. Uh, they present, summarize this in their transition phase versus action phase model. We can see conflict management, affect management, motivating confidence building are all important in both the transition phase and the action phase. Initially, as the group approaches its work, it needs to identify its larger purposes, specify the goals, and discuss the strategies they'll use and plan out, possibly break the task down into subcomponents and assign those components to people. While they're actually working, we see the action phase tasks lined up here and throughout the process. There should be social support provided, management of affect, and reducing conflict whenever possible. In terms of team cognition, uh, analyses of high-performing teams suggest that uh, transactive memory processes are critical, uh, that there needs to be sharing of information across members but oftentimes knowledge is specialized, that certain individuals become trusted to become experts in a particular sphere. And then the team is able to draw out information from those individuals as necessary. So different members are trusted in those specific areas of information. So teams, unlike say a group working on an additive task where each member is considered equal and their inputs equivalent, uh, teams tend to specialize and therefore their performance depends mightily on having all team members present and performing their tasks, otherwise they will falter. As groups work together collaboratively as well as they train as a team rather than individually, they develop a shared mental model for their team's effectiveness. And, and this includes not only knowing who knows what uh, and who is best able to perform subtasks within the group, but that this understanding is shared across all the group members. So the group develops, as it's described, a shared understanding, a collective understanding of how they do their work, who is best um, qualified for particular subtasks within the group, and also identifying when the group needs to step back uh, re-examine its processes and make alterations within those processes to improve their performance. So they need to review their work regularly and identify methods for improving their performance. At least this is what we find in high performance teams. Such teams it's sometimes suggested are able to uh, learn, um, although we often associate learning with individuals. Studying a particular topic, uh, analyses of team learning suggest that teams over time adjust and acquire more information and become more skilled at their tasks. Uh, the case study, which is featured in the chapter dealing with teams, is a surgical team. 
and this particular group that's labeled uh, Mountain Medical. Uh, they approach their task of learning a new cardiac surgical technique very deliberately. Uh, they, they had a clear leader who organized the group, who took the trouble to recruit certain individuals to be part of the surgical team. Uh, they trained very deliberately and they trained collectively as a group. Uh, there was other groups, other, other hospitals also, also formed surgical teams as well. But in those other hospitals, uh, the surgeons and the nurses and the technicians trained for the task individually often attending workshops held off-site in which they, are, they learned the basic skills required for the task, but they didn't learn the skills uh, by working together in an intact team. Mountain Medical, in contrast, worked together collaboratively during the practice phase as, a, as an intact team working on their skills. Uh, analysis of their performance suggested that they uh, took more time than most groups did initially but that they learned very quickly and over time after they reached about 10 cases they surpassed the average performance of most of the other surgical teams and after 50 cases they were clearly superior in terms of performing this task far more quickly time of course is just one way to define effectiveness but when it comes to surgery the uh, time is a very critical variable uh, if you can perform the operation effectively without any errors in a shorter period of time uh, that has a very positive impact on the overall health of the client. Not to mention that a team that can perform an operation this quickly compared to this quickly will be able to do more of these operations in the future. Team cohesion is the final variable that I'll have time to mention and again groups, teams generally should be high in cohesiveness, they should be unified. But I'll always remind you that cohesion is not just simply liking other members of the group or liking the group as a whole, but it has many other components, including task cohesion, collective cohesion, which is identification with the group, emotional cohesion, and structural cohesion. In my final segment in the analysis of teams, I will turn to questions of team performance. Thank you, uh, as always, for joining me.